Next, from the City Club of Chicago, Illinois Senior Senator Dick Durbin welcomes Arizona Republican John McCain as the two speak on the nation's need to reform its immigration laws, what changes they want to see, and what are the chances reform can pass in Congress. This runs about 40 minutes. Our own Dick Durbin. Thank you, Paul Green. Since he brought up 1978 and my run for lieutenant governor, and Jane Thompson, my friend, is here, I've often said to her and Jim Thompson uh, that we didn't have much of a chance in that campaign, but Callison Durbin against Jim Thompson and Dave O'Neill. Uh, and then come September in 1978, something happened which clinched it. At that point, there was no point uh, for us to continue campaigning the birth of Jane's daughter, Samantha. So uh, I always ask about Samantha, and I always remember her birthday because that was the end of our campaign. <laughs> and incidentally, we didn't win, but I always say I got Lieutenant Governor Dave O'Neill so depressed that he quit. So that's, in a way, that was a victory. Um, it was a great, um, great to be with you this morning, and particularly to be with my uh, friend, John McCain, who I'm gonna say a word about in a moment here. Uh, let me acknowledge a couple people very important in my life. My wife, Loretta, who is here. My son, Paul. Thank you. And, and our special friend and guest, Donna Fenton, who's sitting up here with the table. Donna, thank you for being here this morning. A couple people you should know from Chicago who are going places. Wally Brewster is about to become our ambassador to the Dominican Republic. Wally, where are you? Wave your hand. Over here. And Bruce Heyman is about to become our ambassador to Canada. Bruce, glad you're here too. Uh, let me just say a few words because I think the, most, the best part of the program is when John and I sit down and you get to ask a few questions. But uh, a word or two about John McCain. We came to the House of Representatives in the same year, elected in the 1982 election. I uh, served in the House for 14. John moved over to the Senate before I did. And we've served together uh, in the United States Senate for oh, going on 18 years at this point. Uh, I don't need, thank you, thanks to John. I don't need to give you uh, the biography of John McCain, you know it well. But there are highlights in that biography, uh, one of which I want to just say a word about. This year, uh, you know what's going on in Washington with all of the angst and all the bitterness and all of the partisanship. Um, Harry Reid decided to call a special bipartisan caucus of the United States Senate, and John McCain was our special guest who came and told the story, the firsthand personal story, of the years, years he spent in captivity as a prisoner of war uh, during Vietnam. It was one of the most touching uh, gatherings of the United States Senate since I've been honored to serve there. And it's a reminder of the sacrifice that John has made for our country uh, and continues to make in public service. Uh, he is um, the go-to person in the Senate when it comes to trying to work out the most important issues. Years ago, Chris Kennedy will appreciate this, his Uncle Ted worked with John McCain on the immigration issue. And they passed it in the Senate, and I was honored to vote for it, but it didn't make it through the House. But John has been committed to immigration reform long before the current debate. This time around, though, he really rolled up his sleeves and said, we've got to do it again. And John led a group, eight of us, four senators on both sides of the aisle. On his side, John McCain, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, Jeff Flake of Arizona, and Marco Rubio of Florida. On our side, Chuck Schumer, the chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee, Bob Menendez of New Jersey, and Michael Bennett of Colorado. It took us eight months to write the bill, eight months. At least 40 direct face-to-face -face sessions where when our staff couldn't work it out, we were called in to make the final decision. The bill, some 650 pages long, is a thorough, complete, comprehensive immigration reform bill. And when we brought it uh, to the Senate Judiciary Committee, it was reported out favorably onto the floor. 68 votes, 14 Republicans joined 54 Democrats in voting this bill out of the Senate. Sadly, that was almost six months ago. Six months ago. Time is not a friend of legislation. The longer it sits, the more likely it is someone is going to find something to complain about. Not that the bill is perfect, neither John or I would say that, 
But we're hoping that the House of Representatives will now roll up its sleeves and take on this issue of comprehensive immigration reform. It is long overdue, and on a bipartisan basis, our nation needs it. How it, we spent a lot of time talking about H-1B visas, how to bring in the most talented people in the world, not only to educate them in the United States, but to tap into their skills to build our economy, create companies, create jobs. Four out of the last nine Nobel Prize winners in the United States, four of them were immigrants to this country. I hope it's, a, it's an indication in a small way of how important immigration is. I come to it with some prejudice as the son of an immigrant to this country who made it to the United States Senate, but we really need the House of Representatives to roll up their sleeves and to tackle this issue. The second issue that I want to mention is one that is very timely. We just went through the most wasteful six weeks perhaps in the history of the United States Congress, uh, leading up to and culminating in the government shutdown. It was a disaster, a disaster for so many people in terms of the 800,000 federal employees who were either furloughed or threatened to be furloughed mm -hmm. during a 16-day period of time, the people who were looking for government services, critical services, who couldn't get access to them, and sadly, a lot of folks uh, uh, looked at it and said, our government can't uh, function, and those who were the harshest critics were overseas. It really has reached an awful point in American history when we're being lectured to about responsible governance by Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I bet didn't make that up. He said, you can't default on your debt. America can't do that, will it? Well, thank goodness we didn't. And again, I want to give kudos to John McCain. Uh, it took some courage for some Republicans, and many understand John's always in the front line when this happens, to step up and say, this has got to come to an end. John did it with Susan Collins and a number of other Republicans, they sat down with a like number of Democrats and worked out an approach to bringing this to an end. When it was all said and done, we called this for a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. Just two weeks ago, seems like a lot longer period of time. 27, including Senator Mark Kirk, my colleague, stepped up and voted with the majority, 81 votes, to open up the government and get us moving forward. This never, ever would have happened were it not for the leadership of this man from Arizona. He's an extraordinary public servant, but an extraordinary senator, and a great personal friend. Let me call up to the podium for a few words. <laughs> senator Mar John McCain. Now, one last thing. You may not know this, I do. John is a hockey fan. He's always talked to me about the Chicago Blackhawks. So I wanted to present him. <laughs> I wanted to present him with the Chicago Blackhawks puck, the Stanley Cup champion Blackhawks. Welcome you to Chicago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. And uh, one of the more aggravating aspects of my life is to go to a Coyotes game in Phoenix and have half the people there wearing the wrong shirts. <laughs> and I would just like to thank all of you who are now going to leave soon and come and spend the winter with us in the Valley. Thank you very much. We take all plastic, as you know. We welcome you. We welcome you back. Uh, I thank you, Dick, for your kind words. And uh, Chris, thank you. It's great to see you. I, I'll never forget one time with Ted, uh, there was a, uh, a, a freshman Republican, freshman Democrat senator on the floor, and there was a parliamentary question, and they began arguing. So Ted came over and started taking the side of the young freshman Democrat senator, and I, so I came over, and, and, uh, and, and pretty soon Ted and I were face to face yelling at each other. Both other senators left the floor in panic. <laughs> and after it was over, I walked off and Ted put his arm around me and said, we did pretty good, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> the most remarkable, I, mean, I, I, I think Dick and I will both agree, uh, unique individuals that served in the Senate, but he was probably the most in his way. Uh, I, I'd like to say that, uh, it was great to enter Congress back during the Coolidge administration with Dick, and I, and I enjoyed serving uh, with him ever since. Um, he, he, to me, epitomizes uh, what the Senate should be about. 
I can't tell you the number of times we have had heated discussions on the issue of comprehensive immigration reform, but those heated discussions uh, resulted in compromise that I think will, uh, over time, we will sooner or later address this issue. There's 11 million people living in this country in the shadows. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just a matter of when. And um, when that legislation is passed, there will be a chapter written about this individual's advocacy for a group of young Americans, or young, who will be young Americans, called Dreamers. And Dick, you deserve the credit for your continued advocacy <laughs> and outspoken support for these young people who did not come here willingly, but also, I believe, deserve to take part in the American dream. And so uh, I can't t tell you how in, the, in these days of bitter partisanship it is for me to work with Dick. And I also would like to mention to you that Mark Kirk has made an amazing recovery and uh, he's working hard and I'm very proud to have Mark continue his great work in the United States Senate as well. And for those of you who are a few Republicans who are with me, I want to thank you for, uh, for, by the way, Dick, thanks for not mentioning that I lost running for president. Um, after I lost, I slept like a baby. Sleep two hours, wake up and cry. Sleep two hours. And, uh, and I'd like, and I'd like to ask your sympathy for the families of the state of Arizona, if I could, because Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Morris Udall from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Bruce Babbitt from Arizona ran for President of the United States. I from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can go out and be President of the United States. So, thank you for that. These, I'd, I'd like to just make a couple of remarks, and then I think Dick and I would, you'd probably appreciate it more if we responded to your questions or, or comments. Um, these are bad times. These are tough times. Uh, this latest government shutdown affected all of America. It affected my state enormously because of our national parks and our national monuments. There were 600,000 people were turned away from our national parks uh, during this period of government shutdown thousands of people who are not government workers, but work for the concessionaires, will never be repaid. These people at minimum wage. We had to fly food up from food banks up to Tucson, the community outside of the Grand Canyon. We had, we had contractors and subcontractors who had to lay off people. It was a terrible thing we did to the American people, and we should never do it again. We did it once many years ago, and I ho I'd hoped then that we wouldn't we wouldn't do that again. But that's not the way to settle partisan differences, to injure innocent people and harm their lives. And when I look at the approval rating of Congress, it's uh, down to, I think, 12 percent, I think was the, was the last number. <coughs> We're down to paid staffers and blood relatives. Uh, <laughs> you know, <coughs> I used to use that line all the time. And then I got a call the other day from my 101-year-old mother. So. She's out of it. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, th I think the American people want us to do what Dick Durbin has done throughout his entire career. And that is for us to really fight and hard and do everything we can for the things we stand for and believe in. But when the time comes to sit down and do the right thing for the American people, we should be doing it. Uh, the greatest example that Dick and I, in our knowledge uh, and background, was the time when Social Security was going to go bankrupt. Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, walked out in the Rose Garden and said, we're going to raise taxes, we're going to raise the retirement age, we're going to fix Social Security, and they did it together and the American people accepted it. That should be a lesson to all of us, because we do need to fix the entitlement system in this country. We do need to fix the debt system, uh, the debt that is uh, overhanging our children and our grandchildren. We need to do these things together, and maybe because of the reaction of the American people to this latest shutdown, we will see more motivation towards all of us working together. I just want to mention some good news to you, though. I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of this country for several reasons. 
One of them is we now have manufacturing technologies that are so good and so sophisticated that it is bringing jobs back to the United States of America. We are becoming an energy independent country. If I'd have said that 10 years ago, people would have probably been amused. This nation will not have to depend as we have had for the last 50 years or, or more on the Middle Eastern oil because of our tremendous resources that we have here in the country. That will change uh, America. We still have the best and smartest people in America coming from our schools and universities. Silicon Valley is full of people that came to this country as immigrants, but it's also people who were educated here. That's why, as Dick mentioned, this STEM provision that we have in our immigration reform bill is so important. The majority of students are taking science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in this country advanced degrees are not from the United States of America. If those people want to stay in this country after they graduate, we should automatically let them stay. And that's what our legislation <laughs> And that's what our, our legislation uh, is going to do. Finally, I'd just like to say, my friends, the world is changing. The world is changing in a way which is, is incomprehensible in many respects. This device here, this device here has made communications and capabilities to, uh, to organize, to resist, to assert people's rights is happening all over the world, not just in the Middle East. And we are going to see profound and significant changes throughout the world in the 21st century, the likes of which we had never anticipated. Those challenges can be met, but even at the problems that we have throughout the world, and I'm very concerned, we are still the country that people want to be like. These, we're still the country. Why do we need to do immigration reform? Because so many people still want to come to the greatest nation in the world. And I'm very proud to serve in it, and I'm very proud to serve with Dick Durbin. Thank you. Now we'd like to. <laughs> Um, I just gave the staff a great deal of uh, compliments. Where are they? <laughs> come in, staff. Paging Tweed, come on in. Come on in. If you have a question, raise, uh, raise your hand, write it out, and someone will pick it up. Uh, and let's have some questions on immigration, because most of the questions I have so far are not. Uh, um, this is from a uh, um, senator. We have a former Illinois Republican chairman here. so. There may be more Republicans sitting in this room at this moment than probably in the history of this club. Here we go. Uh, Pat Brady, impact of Saudi Arabia saying no to the UN Security Council seat. Senator, why don't you, McCain? Well, the Saudis uh, believe that they are in a titanic struggle with Iran <coughs> in the Middle East. Um, the Iranians uh, have uh, Syria is their client state. Hezbollah is their client organization. Hezbollah now has some 5,000 uh, members fighting in Syria. They have reversed the tide of battle that was in favor of the Free Syrian Army. The Iranians are training uh, the, uh, the Syrians and sending in weapons in huge and massive amounts. And by the way, we are in the most uh, Orwellian scenario in that the Russians are helping in disposing of the chemical weapons of Bashar Assad. Meanwhile, plane loads of Russian weapons are flying into Damascus to slaughter innocent men, women, and children in Syria. It's a, it's a remarkable uh, situation. So the Saudis believe that when we entered negotiations with the Iranians the, on the nuclear weapons that without telling them that we had, in some ways, the word isn't betrayed, but they had certainly disappointed them greatly. And we made promises for a long time that we would help the Syrian, free Syrian army. We have not. We have supplied them with some light weapons, and meanwhile, uh, and we, oh, one time we gave them a couple hundred thousand MREs. MREs don't do very well against tanks. and. Uh, so they believe that in both areas that the United States basically took a hike. So they are going to have to go their own way. And that means Prince Bandar, who was their ambassador here in, in, in Washington for about 25 years, is now their head guy in that area. And 
he said, the message is not to the UN, the message is to the US. That's, that was his statement, not mine. And so uh, we are seeing uh, countries in the region believe that the United States is not engaged heavily in the region, so they're ha having to go uh, their own way. It's uh, turned into a conflict that's regional, it's Sunni Shia, it's Iran, Saudi Arabia, it's, uh, it's, it's developed from what was once demonstrations of some kids that have been tortured because they painted some graffiti on the wall in Aleppo into a regional conflict, which if it, does, if it continues this way, could engulf the region. Certainly Jordan is destabilized, certainly Lebanon is destabilized. Iraq has deteriorated into a, uh, a, a civil war of uh, sectarian violence that we have not seen since 2008. Things are very, very bad in the Middle East. If I could just say a word, I'd, John and I may disagree on some of the premises, but it's interesting we came together on one aspect. Uh, I, I would add to his list Libya, Egypt. When you look at the Middle East, it is in complete turmoil. It's hard to look at a country that's gone through the Arab Spring and now is stable. Uh, it's just not the case. And the president has a tough assignment. What are we going to do as the United States of America? Are we going to send in forces, troops? There's no appetite for that, my friends, not among Republicans, Democrats, or independents in this country. And so when he discovered uh, the use of chemical weapons by Bashir Assad, and we know that he has the second largest arsenal of chemical weapons, second only to North Korea in the world, the president said, I've got to be prepared to let him know he can't do that with impunity. Uh, and an interesting thing occurred. Our traditional ally in the UK, in, with a vote in the House of Commons, said we won't be part of it. Then the scene shifted to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where we serve. And we debated with uh, witnesses and then with a hearing and a markup, a bill to give the president the authority to use force. It wasn't an easy vote. I voted against the war in Iraq. I'm not one who believes uh, that we should move toward committing American troops without serious reflection on what it could mean. I voted for the war in Afghanistan. These were the people responsible for 9-11. It turned out to be the longest war in the history of the United States. That isn't what I was voting for, but that's what happens when you get into a war without an end game in sight. Well, the vote by 10 to 7, a bipartisan vote in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, just in that committee, it didn't go to the floor, gave the president the authority to use force if necessary with Bashir Assad and the chemical weapons. That triggered Vladimir Putin stepping up and the United Nations involvement. Yesterday, good news, and we hope it's good news, there was an early report from Syria uh, that they have cataloged and inventoried these chemical weapons. I go back to Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. We want to make sure that's the case but at least we're moving in that direction. I do not disagree with uh, John's conclusion of the turmoil in the Middle East. I think we have to take care about our involvement to make certain <clears throat> we don't find ourselves in another war. I don't think the American people have an appetite for it. As Saudi Arabia, I think they are more comfortable in a low profile role. I don't think they like the high profile of the United Nations Security Council. That's my view on it. We, um, could, we could have this debate for <coughs> a long time and uh, I, it's, uh, this debate needs to be had with the American people and unfortunately a lot of our domestic issues have overshadowed uh, these looming threats. I think over time if the Middle East continues to deteriorate into turmoil it is bound to affect the United States national security over time. But I would just point out that the President of the United States said that he was going to strike Syria and then he decided that he would go to the Congress of the United States of America and didn't. Now that message is not lost on the Middle East. Those are indisputable facts. Now whether the president should have, shouldn't have, whether it's a good thing to get the chemical weapons out of Syria, that uh, there's no dispute about that. The same country that's helping us secure those weapons, which has now reinserted itself into the Middle East in a way they haven't been since 1973, when uh, Sadat threw him out of Egypt, is now a key player in the Middle East, the world's 13th economy, and we are seeing the slaughter go on. And uh, uh, the, it's horrific. I was at a refugee camp in Jordan where there was then 50,000, there's now 150,000 
<coughs> refugees, and I was being brought around the camp by this woman, and she said, Senator, see these children? I hear there's children everywhere. And I said, yeah. She said, they're going to take revenge on those people who abandoned them and think that there's, and that deserted them when they needed them. We are going to... We are going to reap the whirlwind, my friends, because of our failure to help these people. Okay, nice couple of brief answers to the uh, question. Uh, Senatorially uh, brief. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry. U.S. Senate time here. Uh, that's why C-SPAN has such a high viewer rating. Okay. Uh, sorry. Our professors. <laughs> I have professors on, which even lowers it. But we have a question on immigration. All these others are not. Thanks to my pal Ed Mazur, uh, uh, City Club board member. What can be the effect of the? Huh, what can be the effect on the 2014 congressional elections uh, if Congress fails to enact a meaningful immigration reform uh, for both the Republicans and Democrats? Let me just say that I'm not an advocate of immigration reform for political reasons, and neither is Dick. I've, we've worked together too long on this issue. Uh, we, we work together on this because we think it's important for the country. But I'm also a politician. And the fact is that if we don't pass immigration reform, let's say we do pass it, it will not gain us a single Republican voter. But what it will do for the Republican Party is it will, it will allow us to compete for the Hispanic vote. It will give us a playing field where we can argue for lower taxes, less regulation, smaller government, strong military, etc. But if we don't pass it, we will not compete for the Hispanic vote. Factoid, this is the last year in high school in Texas, the state of Texas, that the majority of graduates are white. So you can do the math in my state, Texas, uh, all across the Southwest and all across this country as to what the Hispanic voter is, is the impact of the Hispanic voter, and that impact will be very negative to the Republican Party unless we get this issue resolved. If you looked at President Obama's vote in the last election, the highest percentage vote which he receives, not surprisingly, African Americans. Third highest, Hispanic Americans. Second highest percentage group voting for President Obama, Asian Americans. That, right. too, is part of the immigration equation. And I would say, uh, I think John has made these uh, observations before, and I don't quarrel with them, but I think it's a much larger issue than just the Hispanic vote. I think it's an issue about whether or not we're going to come to grips with the fact that we're a nation of immigrants, always have been, always will be, and that's what makes us strong. And I think the party that comes to grips with that can then deal with the people who are affected by it. But when the Republicans, pardon me, when the Asian Americans turned on Mitt Romney, I think it was part of the same immigration debate. Very good. Sure. How can Republicans unify to challenge the Democratic agenda in 2014? I think that in the 1970s and early 80s, uh, I think Dick would attest that there was great divisions within the Democratic Party, and Bill Clinton <coughs> did a masterful job of bringing his party together. There are divisions within the Republican Party, and they're fairly significant. And I think we're going to have to have a leader or leaders emerge that bring our party back together. If we continue to lose elections, that will, I think, um, uh, have, have a, that, that strong effect. I'd like to see us show more unification before that happens. Um, that there's always been an element, I'll try to be brief, but there's always been an element within the Republican Party, uh, isolationist kind of, um, just as there's been always a left uh, element within the Democratic Party. And what we have to do is what Bill Clinton did with the Democratic Party, and that is bring our party together with common goals and nominate candidates that can win. We have, we lost five Senate seats in the last two elections by fielding candidates that would have won otherwise, I think you'd agree, or certainly had a much stronger chance to win than, than they did because they were too extreme. And so we're going to have to have a debate and discussion within our party, and I think that th that debate has to be a lot more respectful than it has been at times in the recent past. I, I'm, I shouldn't comment on the future of the Republican Party, but I, but I will say, 
I will say this. I approached a mutual friend of ours, a conservative Republican senator during the shutdown, who I really respect, and I thought his voice could be important, and he said, you know what they're doing to me back home in a southern state? They're running television ads against me on the possibility that I'll be part of a moderating force to end the government shutdown. They're running ads against me, and he said, I'm not up until 2016. That is a new factor that's been brought into this conversation, and it's one that I, I think we, that you might be uh, want to comment on. And Dick's point is, that for the first time I've ever seen, Republicans are raising money for an organization that is running ads attacking Republicans. And uh, that obviously is, is a sign of, uh, <coughs> of misplaced prior priorities, in my view. Okay, well, given the uh, time limits, this will be the last question. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mazur, for, for giving me a question on immigration. I, uh, it's a big issue, guys. Maybe not in this room, but it's a big issue. Thank you. But this is another giant issue, probably the biggest at the moment. Uh, Linda Diamond Shapiro, where are you? I could say all those words clearly. Cook County Health and Hospital System. What are some of the best successes in, enrollment, in enrolling people into the health care system in Illinois or in Arizona? Well, uh, I met in my office on Friday, and our website, at least until Friday, <laughs> was operating very well. Uh, we have a joint system here, John, between the federal government and the state of Illinois. Many systems are not. Many websites are not functioning. One of the most successful, ironically, is in the state of Kentucky. You may have seen uh, Governor Bashir, who was on uh, the, uh, uh, one of the shows yesterday talking about the success they have in enrolling people. We have to get to the point where people have access to websites that give them the information, and we're not there yet. And I, I think that's just plain wrong. It needs to be fixed. No excuses. It's got to be done. But the fact that 19 million Americans have already visited these websites is an indication of the level of interest in what we're setting out to do. John and I disagree on the premise here about this bill, the Affordable Care Act, but there are 1.8 million uninsured Americans in Illinois, 1.8. In this audience are a score of hospital executives. They can tell you these people uninsured get sick and show up at their hospitals. They get treated, and the cost of their care is then shifted to everyone else. That is not a good system. Under Governor Romney in Massachusetts, they started a health care reform where now 98% of the people living in Massachusetts have health insurance. This should be our national goal, 98 or more, if we can do it. We're off to a rocky start with this website, but I think the premise is sound to bring more people under the protection of health insurance and to work within the system to bring down its cost. John may disagree. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any doubt that <clears throat> the initial rollout has been a failure. I think most people agree. Well, the president has stated that he was very upset uh, about the, this failure, this rollout. They'll fix it because we do have smart people in this country. But we've already spent $600 million on the rollout. and by most judgments, it has been a failure. Now, we now have an individual who says that he will have it up and running adequately by the end of this month, and I hope that that's the case, and I believe that's the case. But I think we also ought to ask ourselves, why were they using a decade-old technology? Why didn't they get the smartest people in Silicon Valley to, to come to Washington and set this up for them? I mean, there are brilliant people out there uh, that are the engines of our economy. So I think those questions need to be asked. It also brings into question, how, how does the government do, do business uh, if, if we're spending $600 million on a system that at least initially was not responsive to its stated mission? Um, and I guess the second problem that I have is that in the Affordable Care Act, we did some social engineering that I don't believe is a role for government. And the best example for that is this issue of 50 employees or not. If you, have 50, if you have 49 employees, you don't have to pay certain fines, certain penalties, and all that. But if you hit 50 employees, then you're subject to all kinds of you know, fines and problems and issues and reports and all that. So what, are, so what are people doing? What are business people doing? Stop at 49, have a bunch of part-time workers, work 30 hours or less a week. We're distorting the economy 
because of government legislation. Why not? Why, why, who decided on 50? Max Baucus? Dick Durbin? John McCain? No. Who did this? And so that's just one small example of the engineering socially for a, a stated good. And by the way, uh, in fact, in case you've noticed, and some of our healthcare people are here today, the president said time after time, if you like your health insurance plan, you can keep it. Thousands of people's health care plans are being canceled because they don't meet the criteria and standards for health care insurance plans as laid down by guess what? The Congress of the United States in the Affordable Care Act, even if they may have been perfectly satisfied with the insurance policy they had. So um, this is the first time there has been a major social program, entitlement program, that was done on a partisan basis. There was no Republican that voted for it, uh, and every Democrat voted for it. Every other one, whether it be, you can go all the way back to Social Security, Medicare, Medicare Part D, and other programs, they were bipartisan. And that was one of the problems to start with in, uh, in this uh, exercise we went through. And in 2009, when we passed it, the President had 60 votes in the Senate, overwhelming majority in the House and a whole bunch of people got elected in 2010 in reaction to this legislation. And that's how the Republicans gained the majority in the House of Representatives. So my advice to Republicans and Democrats, if you're going to embark on an exercise of this magnitude, we're talking about one-fifth of the United States economy, health care, then you ought to try to do it in a bipartisan basis rather than ram it through the way that it was uh, done in 2009. How about a big round of applause? You're watching the Illinois Channel.